Uh, hello, welcome back to Horn Throwers. I'm Rob. This is Olivia. And we are joined by Jordan from Falls of Roros and Foray Endomi. Yeah, uh, Foray Endomi. Yep. Okay. Oh, nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> um, your uh, sort of new, almost like sort of like ambient folk, even sort of verges into dungeon synth territory in some places on this album. Uh, but I. Maybe that might be a cool place to start, like uh, asking you to kind of like describe that sound and what you were going for. Yeah, so that's a that's a difficult question. I always um, am appreciative when people help me figure out what it sounds like. Um, so yeah, um, as you mentioned, um, very much in the metal world with Falls of Roros, but this group, For I Under Me, um, actually comes out of the classical tradition as if there's just one, but sort of the idea of a single composer writing parts for other musicians. So um, I, I do that. I write everything down and give them parts. Um, the instrumentation for this record is um, clarinet and bass clarinet, violin, piano and synthesizer, um, double bass, so upright bass played with a bow or with fingers. Um, I play electric guitar and nylon string, so classical guitar. Um, and there's percussion and drum set and electronic percussion, um, and I sing everything in French. Um, so that doesn't really describe the musical style, but it kind of gives you a sense of the types of sounds that you might, that, that you will hear if you listen to the record. Um, and it's inspired by certain classical composers as well, but also um, very informed by neo-folk and sort of like various folk styles um, in general, also trip hop, some jazz. Um, you mentioned dungeon synth. synth. Um, I definitely listen to a lot of dungeon synth and I think, think some of that aesthetic sort of like creeped in, especially um, on one of the tracks, La Chaleur Était Rare, it was our first single. Um, Is that that like this... opens up with, Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, was that like the second or third track on the album? Like, because that was the one that kind of, but when I was like oh. listening through to it earlier, that was kind of what made me kind of yeah, like reach um, for Dungeon Synth. So actually, I know what you're talking about. There's some sections in the first couple songs that, that sort of like, there's really loud church organ and yeah. the violin and clarinet and, and bass are just sort of doing these, um, evolving patterns that aesthetically does have, I think, something in common with Dungeon Synth. I was actually thinking about a track, it's track six on the record, um, and it just opens up with really like forceful church organ, synthesizer, violin, double bass, cl bass clarinet, all sort of playing these big, long duration chords that are super gloomy. So that sort of calls, mm. recalls Dungeon th Synth too a little bit to me um but yeah it's a big mixture um and is as such is hard to talk about without it's hard to talk about in like one sentence <laughs> yeah. um so yeah i've said like a gloomy intersection of neoclassical and folk the That's neo folk with right now the neo folk influence definitely stands out because i'm quite a big fan of like lancum and uh Rome, despite the fact that maybe Rome's a bit politically sketchy, but um, yeah, that de that definitely stood out as an influence to me. Cool, yeah, specifically in the neo folk ish world, um, Tenny, the band from Finland, is really mm. important to me. Um, I love them. Um, yeah, them specifically, I think more than any anyone else, um, but also. Yeah, there's sort of an aesthetic, like, just, it's dark, it's melancholy, gloomy, yeah. um, drawing from that in general, so, yeah. My question from that was going to be, how would you, if you had an elevator pitch to sell, like, <laughs> this band to people coming in through Falls of Rorus, how would you do it? And I think that sums up quite well. Oh, good, good. I actually, I just did another interview, um, and they asked me that same question, and I think, hopefully I did better, I feel like I, you know interviewing is uh takes practice so i think i hopefully did a better job this time we'll see 
I mean, if you ever want to like just sample the audio from this to send to people as a kind of blurb, feel free. Oh, nice, cool. Yeah, <laughs> we'll do. Um, so obviously it's in French. So is that something that's like a second language to you, or how does what yeah. made you want to do it in French? So yeah, we were talking about this a little bit before we started the interview, but um. So yeah, both of my paternal grandparents were native French speakers, um, sort of like Acadian descendants. Um, and there's a big, although it's dwindling, well, it's shifting really. There's a there's a relatively sizable French speaking population in Maine. Um, there were um, more people similar to my grandparents a <clears throat> hundred or so years ago um than there are now um and that sort people are sort of losing their language my family is included in that so i wasn't raised speaking french um my my dad doesn't speak french um though his parents did because there was a big um emphasis on actually assimilation in the in the 40s and 50s so um in maine um it's kind of interesting to i'm going on a tangent but here we go um in maine uh when my dad was a kid, um, French was seen the language of, of like poor lower class people. Um, and you like got punished at school if you spoke French. So yeah, it was that sort of thing. And that was really recent, really. I mean, 70 years ago or whatever. Um, I mean, that's an interesting parallel because we're Welsh and we pretty much had the the same sort of like push in the early 20th century to like eradicate yeah. our native language. And kids were like beaten in school and made to wear like humiliating yeah. hats and signs to kind of punish them and try to sort of beat the language out of them so it's it, it, right it, just an interesting parallel i noticed yeah i didn't i didn't realize it was so similar um but i can imagine yeah a similar idea and i and i imagine that like to a certain degree it was really successful i mean yeah, least, it was, yeah in my in my family it was um so yeah, and it's also kind of funny, French in particular, it's like we now, at least in the States, we have this like uh, fetishism of French, like like Paris, you know, there's yeah. there's TV shows made about it as like this sort of luxury brand <laughs> of a language. <laughs> um, so it's interesting to think about it as like the sort of low class language in that context. But um, yeah, so I decided in college to minor in French and like become fluent for all of those reasons that I just said, like family language. I, I liked how it sounded, um, wanted to sort of reclaim the language for my family. Um, mm. that was like beaten out of us basically. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. And then, um, I took that to a pretty extreme place. I, I ended up double majoring and getting a degree and then I studied in, France for like a month, not that long. And then um, I was a French teacher at a high school for seven years. So that was like my job doing French. Um, and um, I decided that when I started this project in 2016, that um, I wanted it to be all in French. And actually that was, that was a slower transition on our first record that came out in 2017. There's four songs with vocals and two of them are in French. Two of them are in English. Um, the two that are in French are both Paul Verlaine poems that I set to music. And the two in English, I wrote the lyrics for. And then by our next release, I was like, okay, I'm ready to write lyrics in French. I feel confident enough. Um, but it, there was a little bit of like dipping my toes in the water. So, yeah. Do you find it different with writing lyrics in French than writing in English? Yes, absolutely. Um, because there is a bit of, well, it's not my native language. So no matter how much I study, um, I'm not gonna be as sort of fluid with it. Um, but in some ways, I actually think that that is an advantage because like when you're writing in your native language, um, you have all this baggage of like, cliches and things you've read and things you've heard and things you hear all the time and um, things that maybe sound cheesy. And I think that as a non-native speaker, I hopefully um, am coming up with combinations of words that are a little bit 
I, I know that they're like a little bit strange to a native speaker. Um, and I think that's fine um, and good in this context. Um, it also for a while sort of gave me a shield. So we, we've, we've played in Montreal once, but other than that, we've only played in the States, like for Anglophone audiences. And it was sort of this barrier. Like I was singing all this really personal, emotional stuff, but it was in French. So no one knows what I'm saying. Very similar to metal in that way. Like you're <laughs> screaming like crazy. And it's like, you put all this thought into these, into the lyrics, but like, no one has any idea what you're saying. <laughs> um, so that felt like a sort of like protective armor. Now I'm less self-conscious. So um, I've been sharing lyrics more with translations and stuff. And actually we did a, we did a show in August, a small show that classical style, I actually handed out lyric sheets for the set. So like oh, wow. you had the French lyrics and the, in the English. Um, and I got some feedback that that was cool. It wouldn't work at like a huge show, but at, it was a small sit down show. So that was cool. Um, and it feels a little bit more like an intellectual exercise when I'm writing in French than, than in English. I don't know. It's like maybe more fun at, mm. on that level too. Does it become like a yeah. puzzle in a way where you want to say something in English yes. and then you have to like figure out what it is. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it is. Um, I do try my best to not start with like English ideas or English phrases and translate them. Like I try to do my thinking in French, but you know, I have an Anglophone brain, so it doesn't always happen. Um, that was actually going to but... be like a question I was going to ask was like, cause I know I've had different answers from different people who are bilingual, who have said that they only ever think in their native language and have to translate on the spot mm -hmm. or some people who've like really deeply embedded themselves in a language do think in that other language. So it's yeah. Wondering. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm somewhere in between. I, I don't get to practice every day. Um, especially now that I'm not teaching anymore. Um, but there are certain phrases that actually come to me more quickly in French because they just are stickier in my brain. Um, uh, one like dumb example is my partner and I, um, instead of saying like, what to each other, if like we say quoi, which is like really dumb, but that comes to my brain like more quickly. Um, you know, there's just certain little words, like the word for without in French is sans and that like, just sometimes pops into my head. Like if I'm searching for that idea, like that'll come first. Um, it used to happen a lot more when I was teaching because I was speaking so many hours a day that it was like, um, yeah, just the the word would come to me in French first, which was cool. It was interesting to experience that phenomenon. Um, yeah. You were saying about the lyrics as well, like how when you play to an audience, people don't know what you're saying. But I feel like listen to the album, even though I didn't know what you were saying you could still get the feeling how do you sort of get that across musically? yeah um i great question um and i've heard that before too i my friend austin said um we played at shadow woods and he was after after which is a festival here um and after the set he said like man i have no idea what you were saying but i could feel what you were saying which felt good um i think uh I just really try to mirror what's happening in the lyrics or express what's happening in the lyrics musically. So um, uh, generally there's, generally it's pretty gloomy overall, um, but there are moments of nostalgia, moments of stress and anxiety, moments of um, calm and like, taking a breath and I really just try to like mimic that with the music um, as best as I can. So sort of borrowing some ideas from like film scoring almost or, um, you know, tone poems and classical music, like really trying to figure out not only like what makes me feel um, 
represents my anxiety or my calm or whatever, but also try to like figure out how to manipulate other people's emotions with music. So, yeah. Yeah, there's been something I've been reading a lot about, like the like using different modes to communicate feeling and things like that, like recently. Um, mm, cool. Doubt, doubt that I'm going to put it to effect in any kind of meaningful way, but it was at least it was like an interesting kind of like rabbit hole to dive down. Yeah. Is that is that something that you actually like, kind of like think of with some foresight? Like, you know, I want like a a bittersweet feeling and i'm probably gonna get the mode wrong here but like like so i'll use like locrian or something like that like um yeah um great question so generally for foray on dormi this isn't true with all the music that i write but generally i don't necessarily start with um a mode or a scale or a key and i just kind of go um there are some exceptions with this record and speaking of modes um the second and third track are both in f sharp dorian um and the reason for that is it's like if you use it sort of in certain ways the dorian mode is like innocent uh instant renaissance music so like that that's what i was going for there because so much renaissance music is written in dorian um and but f sharp dorian is pretty weird for renaissance like music but i did that because it's i was in e and then i was like man this is really low for my voice so i just put a capo on and transposed all the other stuff and it worked better um as far as the rest of the stuff i'm kind of like um feeling around harmonically uh and maybe not necessarily hanging out in one mode um yeah but um i've composed scores for a handful of video games and um in a lot of ways at least the games that i've worked on the it's emotionally less complex like you really want it's like feel this fe feeling player like you want to feel powerful you want to feel like whatever um and so i will much more quickly reach for you know uh certain scales to for certain vibes or um more closely stick to reference recordings or stuff like that yeah you think that's possibly because like when composing for a soundtrack or a score it's more like work uh, as opposed to like genuine like sort of self-expression because you're trying to deliver like a product so you'll use more shorthand and kind of you know like quick guides to what you're trying to achieve i do uh that is a great point yeah it is work um but i always i do sort of like try to it's it's complicated so with when you're composing for someone else um there are some things that matter more than like your artistic identity. Um, and it's like the client and what they want and the, the, I don't, I don't want to say the product, but whatever the, the game, the film, whatever, um, that matters more than like how you feel. <laughs> mm. uh, um, and so I luckily have been able to, pretty much do whatever I want on projects that I have worked on, but, um, and, and I'm able to sort of, uh, step back and be like, Oh, all of my work sort of as a whole kind of makes sense. Like there are, it's actually a little soundtrack that I'm going to release at the beginning of next year, but it's like a sci-fi mobile game and that I do all kinds of stuff that I would never do with Foray Under Me. It's way sillier. Mm. Um, but I'm like, oh, I'm proud of this too. It's just, um, anyway, but yeah, but yeah, it's also, um, that shorthand helps you get to what the client wants faster. I think they send you references and you're like, oh, I should do my own thing, but also like stick to what they want as well. Um, yeah. Like I wasn't trying to suggest in any way that you were like kind of like phoning it in, but it is obviously it's mm. 
it's not just you expressing yourself no. and creating what you yeah, want to like create. Yeah, it's like constraints to it. Yeah, um, yeah you know, it's, it's, you... it's fundamentally, you know, what you're like, you know, the person who's like, you know, like contacted you and has this like their own vision right. wants. But yeah. Yeah. What um, games have you worked on? Yeah, so um, I the mo the one I was just alluding to is a game called Attack of the Earthlings Mobile, um, and before that I I was mostly doing sound design, but I wrote a little music for Monstrum Two. Um, those are both games by Team Junkfish. They're in Scotland um, and Singapore, and I, I was actually full time with them for a while. So I I worked on those two games, and then another game that they haven't really announced yet that I wrote a bunch of jazz for, which was crazy. Um, and then um, before that, I worked on a game, probably my most similar to Florian Dormi's music in, in video games is a soundtrack I did for a game called Hidden Treasures in the Forest of Dreams. Um, it even has like a similar title to Florian mm -hmm. Dormi, which means Sleeping Forest. Um, if asked what that meant yeah. at the start. <laughs> yeah, Sleeping Forest, yeah. Um, so. Yeah, that that's like uh, sprawling ambient um, stuff, uh, but also the violinist and clarinetist from Foray Andor Me play on that soundtrack. So it's kind of like a yeah. Um, and I did another mobile game too, but yeah, nothing huge yet, but some little games. I thought you were going to say that Raid Shadow Legends that pops up everywhere. You yeah, watching someone's yeah I, I wrote the score okay. for Starfield. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. So um, I was going to ask as well, um, with the two projects, like Forza Vorus and Fori Endemy being very different, yep. do you compartmentalize it where you'd be like, this is what I do for this and this is what I do for that? Or do things cross over? Do you have like an idea for one that you think will work best for the other or vice versa? That's a great, a great question. Um, I don't know that I have to compartmentalize too much because the writing process is pretty different. And also usually we're not, I'm lucky that I'm not usually working on both at the same time. So like right now we're working on a new Falls of Roros very slowly. It's good. We're going slowly. Um, but uh, so like I'm doing that right now and Foray on Dormi, we just had a release. I'm not taking a little pause from that group right now. Um, Falls almost always starts with guitar, whereas Foray and Dormi, maybe 25% of the time I, I write on guitar, but a lot of times I'm hanging out with a keyboard with, um, music notation software or, a, or like Cubase open, and I'm just capturing ideas. Um, but I will say that the process, those processes have sort of informed each other. So we're doing more and more demoing with falls in Cubase um, as we go. Whereas I think a couple albums ago, we would um, really rehearse these parts and then add layers later. So like lead, lead guitars, solos, all that stuff. And we're doing a little bit more of that stuff, demoing it out earlier in the process. I don't know if that was influenced. I actually don't think that that was influenced by how I work with Florian Dormi. It's just a coincidence, um, but yeah, so I don't find um, that I need to... Oh, the other big thing is that for, uh, Falls of Raros is very collaborative. So we're, we work together on everything. Whereas for and or me, I'm working by myself. Um, but I can imagine it being an issue if I was on a time crunch for both projects at the same time, because it's like harmonically and melodically, there's, there's a lot of overlap actually, I think between the two. Um, the way that I write for both groups is, can be similar. Um, but yeah, it hasn't been an issue yet. Uh, yeah. I think because a, a big thing is, yeah, when I write for Falls, at least initially, like I'll bring some ideas and then we'll work them out or Aaron will bring some ideas and we'll work them out. It's just a very different process. Yeah. Yeah, but it's always like fascinating to hear about a like other writing processes and things like that because a lot of the time in the the attempts that we've done to make music it's just really felt like stumbling in the dark and we just sort of like get like a riff salad or like half yep. a song written and then it just gets lost and yeah 
Yeah, we've done a lot of that over the years. So Falls has been playing together since 2000. Well, Ray and Aaron were playing together in 2005. I joined in 2006. Um, but we like played in high school bands together too. So mm -hmm. known, known each other for a long time. Um, and we did a lot of sort of stumbling. Um, and I think have just with more experience, we re we record every rehearsal. Like we have a pretty sweet setup that um, everybody's amp is is either mic'd or direct in. Drums are mic'd. Everything goes into Reaper. Our drummer uploads every rehearsal so we can review it in between rehearsals as we're writing. Um, that helps a lot for, because we'll be like, you know, sometimes we don't have time to work on stuff in between rehearsals. So we'll start the next rehearsal by listening. And it's like, oh, we like tweaked that part. That's cool. And that's a lot easier and better than like, what do we do? <laughs> um, which we used to do. Um, so yeah. Um, but I think the biggest thing that has developed over time with both groups, um, but it's more significant in, in like a group setting, like a, when you're collaborating, is just everybody is super willing to continually tweak parts, continually polish, whatever the word is, revise. There mm -hmm. isn't this, this idea of like, this is the riff, it's done. Yeah. It's like, no, this is like a seed and we're going to build stuff together and around it and keep revising the whole thing until, until the song's done and then keep revising that in the concept of the album. Um, and I've really appreciated that. It, it takes time, but um, I think it's really important. Um, once you get to the point where you have like kind of like revised a riff to the point that you're ready to track it on an album, I know like different bands have a different idea about this, but does the, riff or the song then evolve when being played in a live setting and it might be different every night or do you then yeah. stick to oh. the album as a template yeah so um i'll talk about falls first so mm -hmm. it's an interesting process we we build the skeleton first and what i mean by that is two guitars drums and bass we sort of like work that out um to the point that we record drums and bass so those are recorded cool great and then um, at some point, we might have decided that the riff, the riffs, the rhythm guitar might be better if we split up the, the chord between two guitars or whatever. So we do a bunch of sort of arranging um, to make it sound better, easier to play, all of that stuff. Sometimes it's just like we have a four note chord and we want it to be in stereo. So like we'll record two different parts and pan them, but then yes when we go to play songs live it's absolutely a new arrangement um generally for ray and evan the drums drummer and bassist like they're pretty much playing the same thing the whole time through but aaron and i have to like build because sometimes there's like five guitar parts at a time <laughs> on our <laughs> records so we're just like okay we got to like build this live arrangement um and it took a long time for me to accept that live is a different thing than records. I used to be like, oh man, they can't do that live. What, what are they doing? And it's like, actually like, who cares? It's a different thing. Um, yeah. I don't mean um, by they can't do that live. I don't mean like they recorded some solo that they like can't play. I mean, like there's this elaborate arrangement on the record. Yes why did yep. they do that if they can't do it live and it's like because it sounds fucking awesome <laughs> I mean, interesting. Uh, and, and they can do something different live um so yeah and then for for foray Under dormi we do try to play the the album uh the album version as close as possible but there are some similar things especially with keyboards a lot of times mm. we'll layer different synthesizers and it's just not like Emmett only has so many left hands. So we'll just yeah. sort of like simplify the arrangement a little bit. Um, and also the lineup has shifted over time. So I continually need to write new arrangements of old pieces. Um, we still play some stuff from our first record and even some stuff from our second record. Like I've added clarinet to those songs, um, which takes some thoughtfulness um 
and yeah, it just being like, just accepting that the live moment is different. Um, but as far as like improvising and stuff like that, we, I, neither group really messes around with that. Yeah. I know some, um, like bands and that they'll use a track, won't they, to add an extra thing. Is that something that you do? that you would do to achieve the album sound or you just as you said focus on getting something completely different yeah that is a point of contention in um uh yeah let me think about that so we had talked about doing that for falls for um because synths are they're always in the background but they're an increasingly important part of our records we've never had them live um i feel weird about backing tracks um i think a better solution is to have someone perform them it's a more expensive solution though mm. too um you know i this isn't a promise but it looks like we will have someone playing keyboards at, at, the, at the uk show so oh, that's amazing. cool that'll be a first um i'm i don't like instantly hate a band if they use a backing track um like catatonia does this has this live dvd um playing last fair deal gone down and they have a backing track it sounds amazing um and it's like I, I was joking with friends when we were watching it and somebody was like it's like oh man it would sound so much better if they had a keyboardist and it's like no it would sound the same it would look better <laughs> it's like yeah, actually we, um but <laughs> yeah we saw catatonia at a damnation festival like not a few weeks ago now and they did Dead End Kings the first night in full, and they had what's he called Pear Sodomizer Erickson, who I didn't excuse. I didn't know movie. who I didn't know was actually originally in Their Man Bloodbath, and is now in Ghost. And when I was okay. trying to, I didn't want to search the word Sodomizer on Google, but I found yeah. out anyway in the end. And then the second <laughs> night they had, because obviously Anders isn't playing with them at the moment. I don't know why. So they had the the live track as well. They just they just okay. had one guitar and one played. Thingy, oh so. wow yeah it's interesting it's it's a it's a thing it's like um yeah i've tried to avoid it um sort of the closest thing that i've well this isn't true um for a foray show earlier in the spring i tried to um i practiced with it we rehearsed with it i had um the drum parts for a couple songs like sequenced out on this foot pedal so I was going to trigger them at the appropriate times and like we we sort of play along to them so it's kind of a halfway it's like almost the way a dj would do it or something um it ended up not going well in the show so i abandoned it um but um yeah i don't know i yeah i i haven't i haven't done it i there, there's something about like playing along with a computer that feels a little bit like a bummer to me but Maybe I would feel differently if I had done it and it, it had gone well. I think it would be more stressful as well because you're like, yeah. if I got a time by even a second, this is going to mess everything up. Well, that's true. Yeah, with Falls, it's not as big of a deal because Ray could like keep us on time, like a drummer listening to the uh, click. But um, I never play with a click live. So, and for Ray and me, no one has a click. Like we're very, it's like, chamber music in that way we're kind of like and we don't have a drummer so it's like sometimes very sort of like uh challenging to navigate at least for me um and so staying on track with a click with a with a backing track it's like i don't even know how we would do that we would have to all be listening to a click or have a conductor or something and i mean I you've know. also lose like the adaptability that you can have like because right. obviously you can like if you're noticing that certain people are out of time in the room, you can adapt to that and be like, okay, right. we're doing this tempo now, I guess. Sure. <laughs> and, but... Yeah, exactly. And sometimes, especially with chamber music, like sometimes a slightly slower or faster tempo or louder, softer dynamic, like feels better in a specific room on a specific night. Um, and yeah, like you said, you lose that flexibility. Anyway, I guess, I don't know. If you if you're listening and you're in a band that uses backing tracks, like that's cool. It's it's fine. It's good. Whatever. Um, someday I probably Diversity. will. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. We won't even get started on like drum triggers or anything like that because 
I don't want to start like a war in the comment section. Already. Yeah, yeah. I I don't have anything against drum triggers. Um, it's cool. Yeah, Me especially neither. for metal. Like, um, yeah. It I I so yeah right. You said we weren't going to talk about it. I'll just say, um, like. Uh, in underground music, we play in all kinds of different weird venues. Some sound great, some sound weird, some, you know, whatever. Um, and I think whenever the band can take some control over how their, how they sound, I think that's cool. Um, and I think triggers are a way to do that. Like it can make them more consistent. Um, so whatever. Do whatever you want out there, people. It's cool. Music's a big place. About weird ven- I'm thinking about weird venues now. Oh, Weirdest yeah. venues. Like White Pony and Salford. There's like a... White Hotel. White Hotel. I'm thinking of White Pony. Yeah. Oh. There's, there's like... Wow. It's like... You you get like dropped off there by a taxi or something. And then you... I feel like I'm going to get murdered every yeah, time. Yeah, you don't you know what you're doing. You go around the corner. And then you nice. go in. And then it's like a room, and they always play like co- like collections of horror films on the wall. Don't tell okay. you what it is. And then you go in, and it's like it's always like super weird avant garde films like Hodorowsky. Or yeah, something no. Like then that. you go you go into the actual room. It's like an abandoned building. It's like, it's like there's no like paint on the walls. And the only two times I've been there was to see Lebanon Hanover and Dawn Raid, and it was like okay. it's a crazy venue. I've never been to yeah. anything as as weird as that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Like, on Falls of Roros is um, 2017, one of our 2017 tours. The funniest venue was um, we played in Boston. Boston is, can be challenging for some reason. It's really close to where we live, like two hours away. But um, yeah, we played upstairs at this like retro diner. Oh, wow. I don't know. They had to move. It was really small. They had to move all the tables and like, it was just not set up for a show. And we, we had played some awesome rooms on that tour. So it was kind of a shock. It felt like a, I don't know. It was, anyway, we also broke a window in our van that night <laughs> and it was like freezing outside. Yeah. It's one of those. It's like, Oh, glad we did this. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Gla- one, of awesome. things, the road. one of those things. Yeah, that's it's, it was time, awesome. but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Type two fun. I yeah, I have a friend who like describes all fun. It's this idea that like there's type one fun where it's like fun in the moment. Type two fun is it's fun when you remember. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily fun at the time. That show was fun at the time though. I I'm it was fine. It was good. Anyway. That's that's reminded me of a little bit of Horn Thrower's Law. Years ago, because we lived opposite each other, we used to make food together, like to save money and stuff. And we had pasta, and you decided to stir it with a knife as oh, I no. went to grab some pasta, and the knife oh, hit my hand. And we looked at each other like, oh, my God, this has gone through my hand. We're going to A&E. It hadn't. So we, okay. we always laugh about it now, but at the time, it was like, yeah. It, what Actually, damage has this done? through, like, this sort of flash between the finger oh, and thumb. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Oh, God. It was, yeah. I don't know. It was one of those things where, why were you stirring pasta with a knife? And but why, why was did I you, knowing that I was stirring it with a knife, then stick your hand in the pasta? Because right. I was hungry. Yeah, I mean, sometimes <laughs> those things happen. It's just inevitable. Not a yeah. single drop of blood, though, but it went, like, right That's through. Wow. Sorry. So, that was a no, huge it's, digression. It's Type it's two fun. Um, I was going to yeah, say... Type two fun. How... Did you get involved with uh, Fear Productions? Yeah. Um, so first became aware of Varianne and, and Fia uh, through, she reached out to Falls for a compilation that they were doing. Um, and we contributed a song and that was cool. Um, but I was, sort of shopping this album around the Foray on Dormi album that we're talking about. Um, and I sent it to a label that I'd worked with before, Folk Banger Records. Um, and he suggested Fia. Um, and I basically like took a good look at the label, watched an interview with Barry Ann, and I was like, okay, this is going to be great. Um, and yeah, it's been great. 
Yep. Awesome. Yeah, because we we um see a lot of the stuff. There's the split be- split between fear um, and oh. um Vita de Vita de Testabilis. So yep. we 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 see a lot of the bands from there, and then because I usually when I buy the cassettes, we'll buy them from Vita because it's like the e the EU distribution. Right. I've right. had to buy some stuff from there before, and then I'm, I forget I bought it, and then it arrives. I'm like, oh yeah, nice. I had this. I bought That's the great. I bought yeah. the Lust Tag split and Wheel and Woe, and it came with like a sticker yes. and a little like thing, and I was like, I forgot I even had this. But yeah, that was yeah. a seg segue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the show is usually yeah, that, that is segues. a great thing about like fun impulse purchases like that. You're just like you do it, and it leaves your mind, and you're like, oh. New cassette to listen to. Sweet. We've not even got to the the usual detour in the Horn Throws oh. podcast, which obviously Force of Boris is a Lord of the Rings reference. Oh, yeah. See, there we're sure. going. So you can take this. You're Mr. Hattu, Lord of the Rings, man. Okay. Kind of put me on the spot here, but <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um... I was going to say, what, which which one of you picked the name Falls of Roars? Okay. Um, yeah, great question. Um, it definitely wasn't me. It was either Aaron or Ray. I think they came up with it together. Um, it was already established when I joined, um, which was like around a year into them doing. They had already done the um, like into the archaic demos, mm-hmm. and I joined for the of stone and the stars in the sky demo. Um, yeah, they, they picked it. Um, you know, we were all into Lord of the Rings, all had read them, talked about them all the time. Um, I think it was this sense of, at least for me, it's about, um, you know, it's the waterfall that Boromir sort of returns to the earth over after he dies. Um, so it's, for me, it kind of represents this idea of like, the cycle of life and um, how small humans are, you know, in comparison to the cosmos, nature, Mm -hmm. um, all of that stuff. Um, Definitely like uh, cool ideas for album covers as well, because obviously on the River Anduin, you've got like the Argonath and things like that. So yeah. Definitely things to play around with in the future if you wanted to lean more heavily into. See, I eventually did know yeah. out. It was just more like I felt yeah, like I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt more like I was like being just, prodded, like be a nerd, do it. Right, right. Things. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't want to disappoint anyone. I don't think that we are. We have any plans to like explicitly reference Tolkien other than our band name. We never mm. have. I think that the lyrics, Aaron Wright. I should say Aaron writes all the lyrics for false. I don't write them. Um, but I think they've become more personal or more sort of grounded in reality, um, mm. if anything. And they were, I don't think, ever fantasy based. I do kind of like, like, man, summoning must be having fun. <laughs> it seems like they're having yeah. fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so like maybe... There's no maybe. I, I don't see that happening, but I agree that it's it's an endless Tolkien and other sort of like high fantasy is an endless treasure trove of ideas, art ideas. Um, I mean, I think yeah. as well, you're not kind of like alone in just ripping a name right out of Middle Earth and then not, not, and not being... Yeah, not like I'm thinking of bands like maybe like Gorgoroth, something like that, where it's it is just no, it yeah. sounded cool, we took it, but we're not right. actually. Or, or uh, Kirith Uncle, who of course Kirith Uncle, but right about um, what's he called all the El- time? El- Elric of Malnibene. Yeah. yeah, even Amon Amarth. I mean, it's like yeah, it's Mount Doom. They, they sing about Vikings all the time, so yeah. it's like yeah. Well, Car- uh, I mean, Karakang- I think... uh, like Karakangren as well, like the uh, the. I think the Dutch, like the the Dutch kind of symphonic black metal band. That's like the name of the Black Gate in Black Speech. Like it means like Iron Jaws, but none of their lyrics whatsoever about Tolkien. It's just um, yeah. mainly Dutch folklore that they write about. Cool. Which is really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just kind of a thing. It's like, um, kind of lets people know what they're getting into <laughs> sonically. 
I think we're like yeah. contractually obligated to mention Tolkien like once per podcast. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so right. we got that out of the way. Yeah. So yeah. go ahead. Sorry. I would say we asked we asked you to pick like five songs that inspire yeah. you. I thought we could probably get into those. Cool. Um yeah, so I sent you a little playlist. Um so yeah, do you want me to just talk about all of them? Is that how yeah. you usually do it? Yeah, we yeah. usually cool. go like song by song. I gave then. it a listen as well, and I was it was kind of cool because I knew one of those. I knew um Nico and that was it. Nice. So it was pretty yeah, cool to, yeah. Yeah, so like we'll go song by song, kind of you explain the significance to you. And then Thursday night when the podcast as we also do like a three hour radio show. Yeah, so we've uh, put Thursday these songs night. on the show. Um, but yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um so the first song that I um that I sent is a song by the band Malicorne. Um it's called Le Bouvier which I'm forgetting what that means. It's something like a sheep herder or a cow herder or something like that. Um, but that's from their 1975 album, Le Mariage Anglais, The English Marriage. Um, and so this band in in my mind is kind of like, so they're, they're French um, and they uh, sort of do something similar to bands like um, Pentangle and Steel Eye Span, like that sort of like folk rock um, from the seventies, from the States. And I, I'm sure from England too. Um, but probably all of the UK, but, um, this is sort of like leaned in the French direction, I guess. And this group is actually pretty new to me. My friend Isaac, uh, sent me this record a couple of years ago. Um, but definitely it was an influence on this record in particular. Um, so yeah, it's great. Lots of great folky vo uh, vocal harmonies. Um, highly recommended. Yep. Um, let me see. What else did I send you? Oh, Missy Mazzoli. So Missy Mazzoli is an American composer. Um, she uh, is great. Um, and she has a group that I kind of modeled for and Dormi after a little bit. Um, the group is called Victoire. And um, they've done two albums. The song that I chose is from their first album. Uh, it's called A Door in the Dark. Um, and this is, so it's, it's a small group like ours um, of sort of classical mixed with synthesizer. Um, it's a different vibe though. It's sort of less gloomy than our music, but importantly um, includes clarinet, which is a big part of our record too. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, A Door in the Dark by Missy Mazzoli, um, from the album Cathedral City, which came out in 2010. Are you laughing because it's a uh, brand of cheese? It's a brand of cheese in the UK, Cathedral City, that's why. I think just oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, that's... <laughs> involuntary that's, um, laughter, though. I wonder if she knows that. That's interesting. <laughs> um, next I chose N. Neo, um... Fra they're from um, Quebec, I think Montreal. Um, mm -hmm. And we actually played with them once, Ferran Dormi did. We played um, at this funny, speaking of funny venues, um, this is actually like a nice room, but just, I guess no one goes because we played for four people. Um, so that was worth a funny, very long drive to do that. But um, the silver lining is that I discovered this group, Enneo, who like they've become kind of a big influence on my own music and especially um, my singing. I, I love how Noemi sings. Um, so I chose, there's some folks in the hallway. Um, I chose um, the song Pangea, which means Pangea, um, oh. which is like the, the, the- When the earth was the, like the uh, all the continents. The big continent. yeah. yeah, exactly. So Pangea from her um, there, uh, 2023 album Lo et les Rêves. Um, I love this song. I love this album. Um, this album, though, wasn't a direct influence on um, our record because our record was already done when it came out. Um, but uh, the group in general, so her singing on the album before, 
which I can't remember what it's called, but all of their music is, is recommended. Um, and then finally, no, not finally. We have two more <laughs> to talk about. Nice. Um, yeah. Another um, Quebecois uh, artist, um, Claude Pelgag. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Not sure. Um, this is the most, this is like almost pop music. So, um, you know, this is a, a metal show. <laughs> We're, we're not there at all anymore. And the other, the other things are at least like sort of dark um, enough that we can kind of get away with it. But yeah, no, I, we, I wanted to played... include this. Oh, go ahead. I was saying we've, we've played like everything from like hip hop to folk music yeah, on the had... show in oh, the past. Great. We had okay. Trespasser on and it was just all like, there was a pop song that we, we couldn't play because it, it was, was like full of expletives. And oh, like... <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Nice. But it wasn't anything to do with the genre that it happened to be. <laughs> Okay. Okay, cool. So yeah, this is, I, in my opinion, like really good pop music. Um, and this is also in French um, and it's called J'aurai les cheveux longs. So um, I think it's a breakup song. It's called um, I will have long hair. I think it's, it's mm -hmm. about like the, the idea of not seeing someone for a while. And like, when you, see, when you see me again, I'll have long hair. Um, so yeah, that came out in 2020. Um, the album Notre Dame des Sept Douleurs, uh, so Our Lady of Seven Pains. I don't know if that's a play. I don't know enough about like Catholicism to know if that's some kind of like clever play on words. But um, anyway, I think that record is really good. Um, it is, yeah, it's sort of near the end of the spectrum of like the happier end of the spectrum. Although this song is like a sad ballad, so I guess it fits. Um, and then speaking of sad ballads, um, the last song um, is Janitor of Lunacy by Nico um, from her 1970 album, Desert Shore. Um, I feel like this is essential listening for anyone that's into any sort of dark music. Um, it's so original, especially when it came out. Um, She's just such a great singer. Um, yeah, I love it. I love the vibe. Super dark and melancholy. Um, and her music has been an inspiration for me for a long time, since before I started Florida and Dormi. So yeah, those are my choices. I hope that your listeners get something out of that list. No, it's, it's one of like the most sort of exciting parts of getting a guest on is the exposure to new music and things yeah. like that. So I'm like... Imagine. really excited yeah. for that and hope hope that our listeners also feel the same level of excitement and are not like this isn't death metal sure yeah it's almost like at least for the what i'm plugged into it's it's almost like easy for me to find out what good new metal is coming out like it it's just like always i always hear about it unless it's super super underground but, mm. um but it's like oh you know like there's no world where I'm not going to hear about the new like blood incantation or something. Like it's like yeah. I'm not going to miss that. <laughs> but um, but yeah, like as far as like sort of these more, I don't know. We're just really metal is really special in that we care so much. We're like so devoted, and yeah. other styles of music just don't have that to the same degree. So it's like um, it is like a crazy yeah. level of fanaticism that exists yeah. within metal, which is a double-edged sword sometimes sure. but um but for the most part i think that level of enthusiasm is unique and probably one yeah. of its shining kind of like attributes yeah, yeah. i found it interesting though because when i when barry Ann said to us about how you were looking at like promoting this album which like this would be something cool to listen to and i listened to it i was like i, I haven't been having trouble sleeping lately and like I just listened to it like in the middle of the night. And I was like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" Like this, because it's so outside my wheelhouse. Like, yeah, I, nice. I don't really listen to stuff like that, which is why I was so. I think it's exciting to explore new things, and then when you do eventually return to that kind of like comfortable place with metal, you almost come back with a new appreciation as well. It's sure, it's cool. Yeah, and it's it's really nice. I guess getting to the recommendation ideas, like it's really nice when you have sort of someone that you can trust that can steer you. Cause it's really, you know, 
sure you can open up Spotify and listen to like new stuff, but generally I'm not going to click with like most of, sorry, I should use a different verb. What I randomly select, I'm not necessarily going to be going to resonate with. Um, but if there's someone whose taste I trust that like, they can be like, Oh, you want to get more into this? Like, here's a thing. Here's a list. I really appreciate yeah. that. I, I have like a handful of people who've got their finger on the like the pulse of the underground far better than I have whose yeah. tastes I trust. And also yeah. recently when struggles program the show, my partner's literally made me like a twenty four hour long playlist of just like cool oh. stuff to just like sort of mind. But then the annoying thing with that is I will try and get you to listen to an album for ages and then someone else will suggest it and you'll go, Oh, look at this album and I'm like, I've been trying oh. to show you this for ages. I mean, you do come out with like really great suggestions, yeah. like Wield and Woe and things like that. That was like an incredible recommendation. I was trying to get you to listen to the Wield and Woe album for like <laughs> literally two, three months. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. I had to send you the link. Like the yeah, I say thing. that. Yeah. I um I say that all of that I just said and then like someone will send me a link like, dude this is awesome check this out and i like my god i just won't sometimes which is horrible you have um, to i have to them. like put it in my planner or something i have to schedule it because otherwise <laughs> it doesn't happen i have to be in a mood which i know that i'm going to be receptive to art to kind of sure. like engage with new yeah. stuff and i don't know if that's just like a part of aging or what because like yeah being an old man and stuff now <laughs> right ancient yeah you're not even like. that old <laughs> yeah i'm 36 <laughs> i'll share it yeah oh i'm 29 so okay yeah well i'm a bit i'm a baby i'm 27 <laughs> okay i still feel old yeah you're older than you were so yeah you know <laughs> anyway yeah, so cool. we shall wrap it up with what is it you have to plug? Yeah, so my group, um, I'll say it again, Melancholy Intersection of Neoclassical and Folk. Um, the group is called Foray Endormi, and our new album is called Le Désespoir Utopique, Utopian Despair. Mm -hmm. um, it's out on vinyl and cassette and digital, Spotify, all that stuff. Um, through fia productions um it just came out less than a week ago so really just getting going and yeah hope you enjoy it i very much did we did indeed thanks um that's awesome yeah and also just to throw it in because like obviously most of our listeners are uk based uh falls of raw ross will be appearing making our uk debut at fortress festival next year it's true yeah finally I'm so excited. excited for that like yeah. it's, it's such a stacked lineup already like i'm just yeah, yeah i can't wait for it it's gonna be a fun one for sure but thank you very much for joining us yeah thank you both this is great <laughs>